morning, if you've not already, be finding in your copy of God's Word, John's Gospel, chapter 2, John's Gospel, chapter 2, verse number 13. If you're just joining us, this is now part 10 in our sermon series, Getting to Know You, Jesus, Jesus-Centered Discipleship in the Gospel of John. John's Gospel, chapter 2, verse number 13. When you get there, if you're able, will you stand with me as we honor God in the reading of His Word? If you don't have a copy of the Bible, there should be one in the translation I'm using in the pew rack in front of you. John's Gospel, chapter 2, verse number 13. The Jewish Passover was near, and so Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling oxen, sheep, and doves, and he also found the money changers sitting there. After making a whip out of cords, he drove everyone out of the temple with their sheep and oxen. He also poured out the money changers' coins and overturned the tables. He told those who were selling doves, Get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. And his disciples remembered that it is written, Zeal for your house will consume me. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading, the preaching, and your hearing to understand his holy word. May our Lord Jesus Christ forever be praised. And all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The, The overarching purpose of this entire sermon series, all the way through the Gospel of John, as the title says, is for us to really get to know Jesus, to really understand His teachings, to really follow His leading, and to really be His disciples. To do that is sort of difficult. Because to do that, we've got to get beyond this sort of a a cookie-cutter caricature of Jesus. We've got to get beyond, now I know you like it, but we've got to get beyond that 1950s lithograph picture of Jesus that hung in Grandma's living room so that we can get to the real Jesus, so that we can get to the biblical Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible. And folks, by the way, that is why it is so important to have verse-by-verse, line-by-line teaching so that we don't leave anything out, so that we get the whole picture of Jesus, so that we get the whole story of the gospel. And that's what we are endeavoring to this morning and the weeks to come. But this morning, this morning we see a picture of Jesus that doesn't fit well with, well, with an uninformed or a casual stereotype that so many people have of Jesus, the picture here does not fit that. If I start describing to you a scene, a scene with a heroic figure, and this heroic figure comes in cracking a whip and throwing furniture against the wall, you might think I'm talking about the latest action-adventure movie or or maybe a remake of one of the, uh, the Indiana Jones series, right? Nope. It's Jesus. Cracking a whip, throwing furniture around. Now, some of you are going to see a side of Jesus today that you've never seen before. That's why Jesus-centered discipleship reveals to us the real Jesus. Not the cartoon Jesus, not the storybook Jesus, but the Jesus of the Bible. Amen? So far... In our nine previous sermons, we saw John the Apostle. Remember, there's John the Apostle and John the Baptist, two separate people. John the Apostle, in the opening verses of John's Gospel, reveals Jesus to us as as the Creator. And He is the Sustainer. And Jesus is the Living Word. And Jesus is God in the flesh. And Jesus is God full of grace and truth. And John the Apostle reveals to us that Jesus is worthy of us following Him because He is all of those things. Then John the Baptist comes along. John the Baptist reveals to us that Jesus is the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. He is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. And we thank God for that Jesus. Amen. I thank God for the Jesus who's the Lamb of God that takes away my sins. 
But what I fear so many times, folks, is that many people, many good church folks, they stop right there. They get to Jesus, who's the Lamb of God that takes away their sins, the Lamb of God who makes them a home in heaven. But they never go any further than that. There's more to Jesus. We saw the first disciples who have been called. Jesus says, come and follow me. Andrew follows Jesus, and Andrew goes and tells Peter, and Peter follows Jesus. Philip gets called to follow Jesus, and then Philip goes and tell, tells Nathaniel about following Jesus. And it goes on and on like that, and hopefully still goes on today, where God's people hear from God's Word, come follow Jesus, and then we go and tell. Come and hear, go and tell. I'm going to say that three times, okay? Come and hear, go and tell. And tell. Come and hear, go and tell. That was the model in the Bible. It's the model still today. So we pick up there. Uh, Jesus, last week, he and his friends have gone to a wedding, been invited to a wedding party, and there Jesus reveals his glory by turning the water into wine. This is just a few days after that when we pick up. And this morning, in the common language of today, if we're just talking like regular folks, we would say that Jesus goes to church this morning. In verses 13 and following, Jesus goes to the temple. He goes to church. And what did Jesus see? We see in verse 13 that the Jewish Passover was near. That was the biggest day in, in, um, in their religion, in the Jewish religion, the Passover. And verse 14, Jesus goes up to Jerusalem in verse 14, and in the temple he finds people selling oxen and doves and money changers, and they're all there, and Jesus makes a whip and drives them out. The first thing that we see, number one, when Jesus goes to church, he sees repulsive activity. Repulsive activity. To understand to get into the context, the historical context, we need to understand the temple. We, we need to understand how it was divided up. It was this centrally located big, it was more than just a big building, it was a big complex, and there were many parts of what would have been called the Temple Mount. There were various courtyards, and each one of them would have gotten farther and farther away from this central place. In the middle was the Holy of Holies. And outside the Holy of Holies was another place that was called the Holy Place. That's where only the, the high priest could go. And then there was the court of the priest, and then there was the court of the Jews, and then there was the court of the women. And each one of these courtyards got farther and farther away, farther and farther out from that central place where the blood was applied to the altar, the Holy of Holies. If you know anything about Bible history and archaeology, that's the place that was behind that great big veil, the, the big curtain that was torn in two when Jesus was crucified. The outer courtyard, the court of the Gentiles, is where this was taking place. Jesus, so Jesus is going to church. And on the outer courtyard, the very first thing that Jesus sees when he gets to church is a marketplace set up at church. He walks in and he finds tables set up as mobile banks and booths set up selling doves, sheep, and oxen. And to Jesus, it was absolutely repulsive that the place of worship of Almighty God had been turned into Walmart or a shopping mall. It was repulsive to Jesus because it was also a regular practice. This wasn't something that happened one day out of the year. It was something that was happening all the time. John has Jesus here in chapter 2, Jesus cleansing the temple is what this theologically is called. Jesus cleanses the temple. In John's gospel, Jesus cleanses the temple at the beginning of his ministry. This is right after he's revealed his glory at the beginning of his three-year earthly ministry. Matthew, Mark, and Luke have Jesus cleansing the temple at the end of his ministry, the last week before Jesus is crucified, buried, and rises from the dead. So was it at the beginning of his ministry or was it at the end of his ministry? Many Bible scholars, and I agree with them, believe it was both. That Jesus begins his earthly ministry by cleansing the temple. But they don't pay attention. 
And they're still doing it throughout those three years. And Jesus ends his earthly ministry by cleansing the temple. This was important to Jesus because what he saw going on was repulsive to him. Why? Why was it repulsive? What made Jesus so mad? Well, when we pull the other gospel accounts together, when we pull together John's gospel along with Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we understand why this was repulsive. It was repulsive because it turned the house of prayer into a marketplace. It was repulsive because it took the focus off of worship and put it on buying, selling, making money, and raising funds for the temple. It was repulsive because it was a hindrance to people from all nations coming to worship God. It was set up in the court of the Gentiles. And it was repulsive because it was taking advantage of people by seeming holy. Well, surely if I buy a dove or a lamb at the temple, it's more holy than a dove or a lamb that I buy somewhere else. Well, they knew they shouldn't be doing this. But the people of Jesus' day had justified it and they had rationalized it because, and, and this is human nature, right? We find a way to justify things. We find a way to rationalize things. And that's what they did. They said, well, you know, we need the money changers here to exchange foreign currency or the temple's not going to get enough contributions. If we don't have the money changers there, we might not make our budget. And they said, well, you know, about the animals, we can charge rent there. And, and well, if, you know, if people have got to buy animals for their sacrifice anyway, they've got to buy the sacrifice somewhere. Why not, you know, it's more convenient, let them get it here. Folks, we need to be very careful. And I'm being very careful this morning. We need to be very careful about buying and selling at the house of God. Because we don't want to do anything that Jesus finds repulsive. And we don't want to do anything that will make our Savior mad. Amen. And people in churches today justify and rationalize buying and selling at church the same way that people back then did. We need this fundraiser for the kids to go to camp. We don't need it if it's going to make Jesus mad. We've never had a kid not get to go to camp or uh, youth camp or children's camp because of that. Or, or we need to have, we, if we would do this raffle, if we could do this raffle, preacher, we could buy a new church bus. We don't need a new church bus if getting it's going to make Jesus mad. Amen? Let me admit something to you. All right? I am still growing as a disciple. I hope you are too. I'm still growing in my discipleship. I'm still growing in my biblical understanding. When I look back at where I was when I started out in ministry 20 years ago, I thank God for the grace that he gave to that young, wet-behind-the-ears preacher back then for things that that I did either out of immaturity or ignorance or both. God gave a lot of grace to me. Amen? Does he give a lot of grace to you? Do you look back on your life? All right, just those of you who can, look back 20 years ago and you say, Lord, thank you for the grace that you gave me for what I did that was either ignorant or immature or both. Amen? Amen. So, all right, we're all in the same boat. So I'm still growing as a disciple. I'm still growing as in my biblical knowledge. Twenty years ago when I was a youth minister, I did every kind of fundraiser that you could imagine. I did fruit sales and I did silent auctions and we rented out youth to do manual labor and we sold long distance telephone cards. How many of you remember those before cell phones had unlimited, right? But folks, I didn't know any better. I didn't know any better. That's why you've got to keep studying the Bible. That's why that, that discipleship is a lifelong 
process. That's why you've got to keep pressing in to the faith. That's why you can't reach a point and say stop. Because no matter how much you think you know of Jesus, I promise you there's more. No matter how much biblical knowledge you have, I promise you there's more. I was talking to, to Lee about this a couple weeks ago, and, and, and he and I, we we both do the same program. We read the Bible from beginning to end every year. I read through the Bible every year. And every year I learn something more. Every year I understand something more. That's why we don't stop coming to Sunday school. That's why we don't stop learning about the Lord. Because no matter how much discipleship you've gotten, there's more. There's more. And folks, I promise you this. We don't cross the finish line until we get to glory in the kingdom of heaven. There's more. Don't stop learning of Jesus. So, just understanding a little bit about me. Folks, that's why I'm opposed to church fundraisers. It's not because I'm being mean. It's not because I'm being inflexible. It's because it's not biblical. And it's because I'm... Look, come hell or high water... I'm just going to follow Jesus. And I believe that's something that you should want your pastor to do. I'm just going to follow Jesus. And listen, I try to support all the things. I support the band, and I support the soccer team, and the FFA, and the FHA, and ROTC, and everything else. I buy cheese from the Shriners. I, everything in our, I, I buy the chicken plates from the fire department. Everything that's in our I believe, I believe in supporting your community. I believe in supporting your schools, right? So I, I buy from the first one who gets to me. We've got lots and lots of kids, whatever the fundraiser is. The first one who gets to me, that's the one I buy from. But folks, Jesus says, not Brother Kurt, Jesus says that church isn't the place for that stuff. Do you hear me? That's not me, that's Jesus. Especially not in the sanctuary. Maybe in the parking lot, that's where, where I try to, you know, usher the kids out there when I see them with that. Maybe in the dining hall. But, but listen to me, even then, folks don't want to come to church and feel like they're pressured to buy something. Some folks are doing all they can to make the paycheck stretch from the first of the month to the end of the month. And they don't want to feel that they've been made guilty by not, I mean, these, these kids, they, they come up to you, that precious little face, my goodness, right? So... Here, here's the, that's the practical. Here's the, the biblical. I, I don't think that Jesus says that we can never buy or sell anything as a church. We have to buy electricity. We have to buy Sunday school material. Uh, we, we have to buy toner and ink, and we go through a lot of toner and ink and paper. Those of you who are not involved in the leader, we go through a lot of toner, ink, and paper. We buy a lot of it. I don't think he's saying you can't buy or sell anything. We've had to sell things in the past, things that we didn't need anymore. So what is our practice here at New Bethel? What, what are we striving? What am I trying to lead you to do? To be, be as consistent as we can be. We can't be 100%. As much as we try, we can't. But what am I trying to lead you to do? To give of your own free will. Cheerfully, voluntarily, not under any compulsion. Let me give you some examples. We do a Wednesday night fellowship meal. And the Wednesday night fellowship meal funds a lot of our ministries and, and a lot of our missions. But it's a free will offering. There's, if, if you can't give anything, you don't give anything. If, if you can give a lot, you give a lot. If you can give a little, you give a little. It's just a free will. There, there's nobody that's going to say, wait, you didn't pay. You can't go through the line to eat. We don't do that because it's free will. You decide of your own heart what to give to, if it's the youth ministry that's doing it that night or the children's ministry that, that night or the Annie Armstrong offering. You decide it's free will. You give what you want or you give nothing at all. Our media ministry in the back, we have never sold any of our CDs or DVDs. We don't sell them. They're always free. Brother David would love for you to pick up a stack of them as you go out the door. They're free because we don't buy them or we sell them. We have never had a kid 
not go to camp because of money. Did you know that the church covers the cost for the kids to go to camp? All of the cost except the deposit. The, the cost of camp is a lot more than that deposit, folks. And on top of that, we have scholarships for the deposits. The, the scholarships for the deposits cover any kid. If, if you can't cover the deposit, if you, can't, if you can't get together the deposit, we've got you. It's taken care of, all right? So that no kid would ever not get to go to camp because of a lack of money, amen? That's how we operate. That's how I want us to operate. And that's how, for the most part, we do operate. And I believe that's how Jesus wants us to operate. There are churches all over the country, though, and they're selling ferns and candles and raffle tickets and, and everything else, just like I used to do. And there was a time I would have joined them. But the more I've studied the Bible and the more I've grown in my faith, the more I have become convinced of this. So I've, I've changed my mind about Miss Ollie, Miss Zula. I've changed my mind about something, haven't I? The more I have become convinced, listen to me very carefully, I'm convinced that Jesus' church needs to do things Jesus' way. Jesus' church needs to do things Jesus' way and be very careful that we do nothing that makes him angry or he finds repulsive. Repulsive activity. I've got to move really fast. Number two, righteous anger. Verse 15. After making a whip out of cords, he drove out of the temple with their, he drove out the sheep and the ox and he poured out the money changers and he turns over the tables and he tells those selling doves, get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. Here's what I was talking about in the introduction. Let there be no mistake about this, all right? Jesus got mad. He got mad. Jesus didn't say, Now, for such if thou wouldest, wouldest, removest thou these doves, I pray thee. He said, Get these things out of here. This is my father's house. You turn it into Walmart. Got his whip. <laughs> Went up to the, the money changer's table and, and he... Woo! He got mad. Jesus was mad about this. We, we think of Jesus as all about love, and he is. And we think of Jesus being full of mercy, and he is. And we think of Jesus being meek and mild, and he can be. But he can also get mad, and he did. Getting angry about something isn't wrong. Let me say it again. Getting angry about something is not wrong. The Bible doesn't say to never get angry. It says be angry and sin not. And do not let the sun go down on your wrath. What Jesus had here was righteous anger. And we could learn a thing or two about that. Jesus got mad about the right things. We get mad about the wrong things. Amen? Jesus got mad and did something about it. We get mad and we pout. We get mad and we stew. We get mad and we plot revenge. We get mad and we post passive-aggressive things to Facebook. We should have more righteous anger, not less. Folks, there are plenty of things going on in this world that should make the people of God and the church of God righteously angry. And it should motivate us to do something. And not just do anything, not pout, not plot, but do the right thing. Righteous anger should lead to righteous actions. You are righteously angry when you are angered about the things that anger God. You are righteously angry when you are angry about the things that anger God. You are righteously active when you do something to remedy it in a way that honors God. Righteous anger and righteous activity go together. They cannot be separated. And it is only righteous if it is what makes God angry. And it is only righteous activity if it is done in a way that honors God. Repulsive activity, righteous anger. Number three, a respectful attitude. 
I won't settle here for the nine and a half minutes I've got left. Verse 17, and this, his disciples who were there, they see this, they, they watch all this take place, they hear Jesus, they, they see him with the whip, they see him throw the tables over. In verse 17, and his disciples remembered that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. Jesus had zeal for the house of God. And folks, that's not a word we use very often today. Do you, have you used the word zeal this week? It means that Jesus was passionate about the house of God. It means that Jesus cared very deeply about the house of God. It means that Jesus honored the house of God. It means that Jesus respected the house of God. And it goes all the way back to Jesus' childhood. Remember, Mary and Joseph go to Jerusalem and, and they lose Jesus and they go back. And where is Jesus? He's sitting on the steps of the house of God, teaching the elders. And he tells his parents, didn't you know that I must be in my father's house and, and about my father's business? Jesus had zeal. He had respect for the house of God. We need that kind of zeal. We, need, we should be that type of passionate about the house of God. We should care deeply about the house of God. We should honor and respect the house of God. Oh, but preacher, I know somebody spiritual's thinking this, so I'm going to answer your question. Oh, but preacher, in the New Testament, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's not about some building, preacher. I'm, I'm doing a little voice like that to mock you, but I'm not really wanting, I really am. I know how those super spiritual people think in their minds and how it sounds when they speak. <laughs> oh, but preacher, we're the temple now. It's not about some building. I agree. It's not. It's not about the building. But I'm going to tell you this. Whether the people of God are gathered in this beautiful sanctuary or if the people of God are gathered in a cave in the side of a mountain, or if the people of God are gathered in Westminster Cathedral, or if the people of God are gathered in a brush arbor out in the middle of some cow pasture, wherever the people of God are gathered to worship God, that is the house of God. It doesn't matter if it's a building like this or a, a tent. Wherever the people of God are gathered, that's the house of God, and we should respect it. And folks, there's a way to act in the house of God. Let me say that again. There's a way to act in the house of God. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Timothy 3.15, he says, I have written so that you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. Respect for the house of God, respectful attitude. Can I get practical here for a minute? All right. Don't get bent out of shape. I'm just being honest, all right? Folks, listen to me. Kids don't naturally know how to act in church. They don't come out of the womb actually knowing how to behave. They don't know, they don't know how to do that. They're kids, right? I'm going to say this about five times. Do you know why they act like kids? Because they're kids. Nod your head like this. They've got to be trained. They've got to be taught to respect God's house. I do not, I repeat this, I do not want to see us do like so many churches and send the kids out so the grown-ups can have an undisturbed worship Experience. And here's why. Because these kids are just as much the church as the, the gray-headed man or woman. They're just as much the church. We don't need to send them out. We need to train them and teach them. So, so with respect to the house of God and particularly with children, we need both understanding and expectation. Understanding. Say that with me. Understanding. But then we also need number two, expectation. Say that with me. Expectation. Understanding. Understanding is that kids are kids. And not one of them is going to be perfectly behaved. No, not one. We could sing the no, not one song. Not one of them is going to be perfectly behaved. No, not one. Hey, folks, a living, active, 
growing church full of kids like this one is going to have disturbances from kids. It's going to happen. There's no way around it. And thank God that we have it. So that's understanding. Understanding is, you know why they act like kids? Because they're kids. But then number two, you can't just have understanding. You've also got to have expectation. When the kids are at God's house, these children, those children that were gathered up there this morning at children's moment, do you know what? They are in the process of learning. They're learning. They are learning how to have a respectful attitude. That process requires instruction. No, 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 don't do that. And it requires correction. You do that again, you know what's going to happen. Instruction and correction. Instruction says, don't do that. Correction says, you do that again, you know what's going to happen. So here's what we do. We, we go through a process. And it's not going to happen overnight. Some of you say it never, it, I wasn't able to get it completely done until they were 17. You teach them the, the process of sitting still. You teach them to take notes on their Bible treasure map. You take them to the bathroom between Sunday school and church. It's just, a, it's a process. It's instruction. It's little bit by little bit. And the expectation is realistic where we say they're a kid. Now, it's not going to be perfect. And everybody else in the church, especially, look, the folks that, if you don't have, folks that, I'm going to reveal a secret to you. Those of you who have kids and grandkids, and you're, you're always around kids and grandkids, you are conditioned, you are conditioned to their sound and their activity where it doesn't bother you. People that aren't around kids and grandkids all the time aren't conditioned to it, okay? So those of us, me and Buck live at our house by ourselves, me and my old dog. Those of us who aren't around kids all the time, we've got to understand that they're kids and they're going to act like kids and they're trying to instruct them and they're working on them. But look, just be glad they're here. Amen? Amen. Understanding and expectation. We can have unrealistic expectations about kids, but we've, we can also expect too little from them. And then grown-ups. Children will learn to respect the house of God from you. They will learn to respect the house of God if you respect the house of God. Jesus had a respectful attitude for the house of God, and we should too. And we should pass that on to the next generation. This morning, I've got to wrap it up. Did you see a Jesus you'd never seen before? Had any of you ever imagined Jesus throwing furniture around and cracking a whip? There's more to Jesus. There's more to Jesus than what you've ever seen. Get in his word. Get in the gospel and find the real biblical Jesus. There's more. I don't care how much you know about Jesus. There's more. Do you really know this Jesus? Do you know him as your Savior and Lord? Are you saved? Can you say today, I know that Jesus is my Savior and heaven will be my home. Can, can you say that for sure? If not, today you can. Brother Eric and I will be standing up front in just a moment in our invitation. We'll have our Bibles opened and we'll show you from the Bible how you can know today that Jesus is your Savior and heaven will be your home. Do you respect God's house? Can you turn it up a notch, setting an example for a younger generation? Today, let's, let's make a decision. We're not going to do anything at God's house that's going to make Jesus mad. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for the grace that you've given us when we have acted in ignorance or immaturity. We thank you, Lord, for the grace you're giving us still today. I pray, O oh God, that during this time of invitation, that those who need to make a decision for you, to follow you, to become your disciple, to join this church, to be baptized, to make a rededication of their life to you, whatever that decision is, they'll feel freedom and liberty to do so. Bless this time of invitation for your glory and the good of your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand together? I have decided to follow Jesus.